Welcome to the Fit Money Podcast, where we'll discuss something we all need through our entire life, financial literacy, but also asking the tough question, why aren't students learning it? Financial literacy is more than the math and a behavior we'll need beyond the classroom. So we're learning how we can help students, families, and teachers build a new generation of financially fit students everywhere. On this episode, Fit Money Executive Director Jessica Pelletier meets with John Gans, a business teacher at Cape Cod Regional Technical High School in Harwich, Massachusetts, to discuss the vocational school model and how they're working towards financial education for their students. Today, we're answering questions around how we can prepare students for employability, how we can practice healthy money skills for after graduation, and the different ways students learn today, along with some misconceptions that exist around them. Hi, John. Thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. I get so excited when we talk to educators who are in the classroom because you are the whole reason uh, for Fit Money's existence. Uh, and so I want to hear about what you do, uh, where you teach, and okay. what type of students you reach every day. Awesome. I, I teach at a school called uh, Cape Cod Regional Technical High School, and it's located in Harwich, Massachusetts on Cape Cod. We have um, two schools that do the, do our model on Cape Cod. One is we're kind of at either end. We teach in our specific school. We have 15 technical training programs. Uh, so students learn trades uh, anywhere from engineering to health, health services, um, traditional, what we call traditional trades like uh, construction, uh, culinary arts, that kind of thing. But we're also fortunate uh, to have a strong and well-supported business training program because a lot of our kids will not need to go to college. Uh, they will be able to enter the workforce pretty much trained. There's a lot of support for our um, our programming, which has to do with um, not only financial management and literacy, but also uh, entrepreneurship and small business management, things like that. Uh, and in what we call in our in our trade employability skills, which teaches kids not only how to to do the job, but to find it, acquire it, and then keep it. But I think one of the most exciting parts of it is the financial literacy. That's just been a huge uh, uh, draw for students, and they're very interested. And so it's been great introducing Fit Money and other uh, activities that we can do because they realize that they're going to make money and they need to figure out how to handle it earlier than most kids in their teens. Some of them already do make quite a bit of money with our co-op program, uh, and they I kind of get a kick out of the the students. In March uh, of every year, we will have a day in class where we'll help them do a tax return. And usually, most teenagers get a, a refund of everything that they've paid in because they don't really make enough. But um, we have seniors that actually need to pay, and they, they get a little <laughs> they get a little upset. And then I say, "Well, congratulations! You should be proud of yourself." And they said, "But you you tell us we need to save money." I said, "Well." You also need to pay your taxes and support the teachers that tell you how to do that. So I said, that no, that's a good thing. Being able to uh, make the kind of money that you do in high school uh, when you should be in school uh, is really cool. I think it's awesome. So uh, so there's a lot of interest because of that. That is so great. I, I love that story. You're right. We, uh, we actually just launched a, a taxes badge for that exact type of, of young earner. Um, okay. for that student who probably has their first job and you're right, didn't make the threshold and, and we tell them to file because they're going to get that refund. So exactly. I love that, yep. that your, some of your students are actually already well above that threshold. And, and it's no surprise seeing as, you know, the, the employment, you know, I'm not sure we're at the crisis level yet, but we do see quite a bit of openings mm -hmm. in the trades yes. um, these days. And, and so it's wonderful to hear that that you are um, serving so many students uh, to go into that profession. When you have those kids coming in in the ninth grade, do you find that a lot of them already know uh, kind of what they want to be or, or have a plan, or are you really taking them and kind of graduating them into that career? Some do, uh, and or they they may have family that have existing businesses, so they'll they'll say, well, if you go to school here, uh, you'll be trained to take over the business, 
And so some of them really like that idea and some of them don't. Uh, but the way our model works in Massachusetts, um, and it's really, um, I think a few years ago, Harvard did a study of technical models and technical training and Massachusetts was ranked as number one um, in terms of how we do it. But um, we go through a process called an exploratory uh, class and they, they basically have to see every one of our programs whether they'd like to or not. And so they might come in here and say, well, I really want to be uh, a marine services advisor. or I want to work on cars or whatever. And then when they go through the exploratory process, they change their mind. And sometimes that's a problem for their dad, who's the plumber that wants them to take over the business and he wants to be a chef. Uh, but generally, uh, they, it's, it's, they're going to be happier where they find their work fulfilling. So they do, they, a lot of them do come in and a lot of them do change their mind. So I think that program works for that reason. I love that model. That is so great. We're starting to hear so much more about career exploration, even trickling into the middle school. Yes. Um, and I think that's so appropriate. You know, even with something like financial literacy, which, you know, we have a kind of a shared belief in, you know, people traditionally have thought that it's not really something you have to teach until junior or senior year or perhaps even in college. And Correct. we're just finding that's just way too late. Um, because is. as you've said, they, these kids have a relationship with money far earlier than we ever really traditionally thought. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, it's true with, with career. And I love the idea that they can come in with one idea and potentially enter into something completely different because of that exposure. Yes. Yeah. It is kind of neat to see. But the, the universal appeal <laughs> for all of them is that they, want, they do want to make money and they, they understand that they need to manage it. So um, your program has, uh, I've, I've used that this year for the first time with, with seniors. Again, the technical model means that I don't see them every day. It's generally a, a two week on and a two week off scenario. So in my classroom setting, I'll see them for two weeks and then they'll, they'll be off in their technical training uh, for the other two weeks. So it sometimes becomes uh, a little restrictive because you, you get started and then you realize, oh, they're going to leave. Uh, and then there's reintroduction when they come back. And so there's a little bit of, uh, of time necessary for planning, but um, they've really gotten into it so far. John, I'd love to uh, actually uh, touch on that a little bit more, because I think what you just mentioned is uh, alluding to what I think is a very common misconception about vocational technical uh, schools and certainly how they are here in Massachusetts. And you said that Students have kind of a two-week course of that technical education and then a two-week course of academics and, you know, the more business and math mm -hmm. and whatnot. Can you talk about that and how that balance of both um, kind of the actual hands-on training plus the classroom training really fits in your, in the vocational technical model? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, my, my definition of employability skills is the ability to find, get, and keep a job. And so you can be a great plumber or uh, a great auto mechanic or a great, uh, we, there's so many things that you can be good at with your hands. You also need to be able to keep that job by dealing with people, by conversing with people and by communicating, whether it's in writing uh, or any other way. And so we have a, our school is set up as an academy model and like-minded uh, trades are grouped and clustered together with academics that also utilize the student's interest in those trades to train, well, I call it train, but to learn uh, those academic subjects. So their math, their science, their English, are they use their actual technical training. If you remember in high school, in math class, you'd say, when are we going to use this? Right. We, can <laughs> we can answer that uh, very specifically in their career field that they're looking at. And so it, it there's a little more buy-in from the students that they understand that they need to be well-versed in all areas of, of education, not just the hands-on part, which they think they prefer. Uh, but they also see that they do well in everything. They can do really well in their trade. And I have to imagine, um, I'm a little biased. Obviously, I'm also in Massachusetts uh, where you are, John. And I think you mentioned earlier uh, that there is quite a waiting list for mm -hmm. our vocational yes. technical schools across the state. 
And I would imagine that students and families are realizing that that is a really great solution uh, for their family and their child. It's huge now. And we, we take just as many students as our, our waiting list is uh, the size of the class coming in. So we could basically fill twice. Some students, after they get here, they, they realize it may not be for them. And it's not for everybody. Uh, they realize it's difficult. Um, and I think a lot of people think it's it's easy and it's the easy way out, but it's just the opposite because you get two diplomas and they realize that there's a lot of work involved. I still have to get my high school diploma. I still have to pass all the state mandated tests, but I don't have as much time to do that. So there's a lot of work that they need to do on their own. What happens is they'll decide, well, my other school, or it could be a social decision where they say, you know, I have friends in my other school. It's a big it's kind of a big decision for a 13 or 14 year old person to make um, and say, well, my, all my friends are going to my my sending school, my regular school. Um, but maybe I want to try something new, but I have to make new friends. And um, so that's that's kind of tough for students that age. So let's dive in a little bit. You're a business teacher. Um, how long have you been teaching yes. business? Uh, 25 years. Oh, my goodness. Wow. So you've seen a, a lot of change. Sure. Obviously, you um, see the how the economy and those external factors, you know, play into decisions that you make. Um, what do you think are the most common misconceptions that kids, uh, you know, their, the age that you work with about money and kind of making financial decisions that work best for them? I think they, they don't understand where their money goes. One of the biggest uh, eye openers when we cover it in class is how come my paycheck isn't what I think it's going to be. We have a co-op program in their junior and senior year, and they don't realize that they will need to pay taxes because they're going to make enough money to meet that threshold. Insurance, they know about car insurance, <laughs> but they don't think about other types of insurance. And car insurance is a killer for young for the young people. So um, they think, oh, once that's over, I, and there are other things that um, kind of surprise them about that. Others are totally aware uh, at a very early age that that they know what they're in for. I had a student um, a couple of years ago, and I was helping him with with his tax return. And he basically, I, I forget the number exactly, but it was in the, let's say, $35,000, $36,000 as a senior in high school because he was working for a plumbing company. And then during the summer, he was working overtime. So between his school training and the summer, he, he made quite a lot of money. And when I said, well, you, you owe a few hundred dollars in taxes, you should be proud of yourself because you earned the money in, in high school to pay than most many people do in the whole country. And he said, well, I don't have it. I don't, I don't have the money to pay my taxes. And I said, you're a plumber. You should have that money in your pocket. And um, he said, well, I bought a truck. And so he, he bought a truck that was more expensive than my first house. And now he's paying for it at $700 a month. And he had his uh, auto insurance was huge. Uh, his excise tax, he knew nothing about. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't take that aspect of our classes. Not everybody gets all these aspects. So And, and sales tax, <laughs> that was the other thing that he didn't think about. So on a $70,000 truck, the sales tax is, is, is pretty substantial. So those are the things that um, I think they they don't really get yet, um, but hopefully through a little education they will. You know, you mentioned uh, the Credit for Life Fair, uh, and we had uh, a great uh, guest early on in our, our podcast release um, from Cape Cod Five, who I know is is your sponsor of the fair. And I look at that fair as a great way for kids to do exactly what you just talked about: if kind of make those decisions in a safe space. Uh, and yes. really figure out how much those, uh, like you said, insurance, health insurance, and and even the vacations that 